Our next order of business is the adoption of the December 14, 2017 minutes. Uh, any comments, concerns, or changes by the committee, please? I move to accept the minutes. The motion has been moved by Ms. Hubbard and seconded by Dr. Uh, Smith. All those in favor of said motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion carries. Unanimously. Uh, before we begin, the next item was uh, supposed to be a uh, call of the audience, but I wanted to uh, ask those of you that are here in attendance tonight if you could uh, bear with me a second and raise your hands. How many of you are here to speak uh, about the building facility, uh, uh, the current, either the new or phase two? One person. How many are here to speak on any other issue? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick to the agenda this evening uh, and go ahead with a call to the audience uh, first and that would be Ann. And you have, let, let me give you the rules of that. Uh, yeah, You've got three minutes. Okay. And, you took uh, 12 hours to try three minutes with me. <laughs> Would you stand up here? Yeah, and you need to state your name and address for the record. Oh, my name is Evan. Uh, does this count in my three minutes? No. <laughs> I'll wait until you're done. You're all over this. Hopefully you don't live somewhere, you know, five times around the world. Ann Haver, 2080 Southwest Mont, Drive, Tucson, Arizona, 85713. Ready? Yep. I'm Ann Haber, and I'm a volunteer dog walker, a board member of Southern Arizona Beagle Rescue, which is a pack rescue partner, and a Pima County taxpayer. It is in the role of a taxpayer that I'm speaking to you today. Like many others, I am disappointed at what we were promised during the planning stages of the new shelter and what we got. My greatest concern is for the dogs who are awaiting adoption in the new pack. There is a lot of confusion regarding exactly how many adoption kennels and stray hold kennels there will be in phase two. I have heard that phase two will be strictly for stray hold dogs, and I have also heard that 40 of the phase two kennels will be for adoptable dogs and the rest for stray hold. Even if we add 40 adoption kennels to the 84 that we have in phase one, our dogs will be dangerously overcrowded. We were told the kennels would be single occupancy, and the literature from the UC Davis consultants states that dogs should not be co-housed. The kennels in Phase 1 currently house between one and four dogs, which is unacceptable. In the most recent Phase 2 plan picture I have been sent, it looks like Phase 2 will have about 136 kennels. Even adding 40 of those kennels to our current 84, we will only have 124 single occupancy kennels for adoptable dogs. It is very rare that our normal census of adoptable dogs is 124. This is our slow season and last Friday we had 168 adoptable dogs. I do not know our stray hold numbers, but considering that the old shelter had at least 134 kennels for adoptable dogs only in the main shelter, and the tent had 90 kennels for stray hold dogs, the number of kennels planned for Phase 2 looks woefully inadequate. When we voted for Prop 415, we thought we were voting for a premier no-kill shelter. If we end up having to double up our adoptable dogs into single occupancy kennels, it will lead to increased disease, stress, behavior problems, longer shelter stays, and increased euthanasia. This is not what we voted for. Administrators will say that to solve the problem, we simply need to decrease the length of stay. PAC has a robust network of rescue partners that takes as many dogs as possible. We have a foster program, and that has helped. Social media helps. Sending our dogs to other regions of the country has its own risks for our pets and should not be relied upon as a solution. And although I have the utmost respect for our volunteer and staff adoption counselors, we simply do not have enough of them, nor do we have an appropriate process to get our dogs out quickly and safely. Unless we see great improvements in adoptions and outcomes, our census will likely remain the same. That is, until summer hits or we take in a large hoarding case. In summary, it appears as if the new shelter will have less space for adoptable dogs than before, and that is not what we voted for. Supposedly, Phase 1 came in under budget. As a taxpayer, I am requesting that that money be used to add additional kennels to Phase 2. If you do not, and we have an overcrowded shelter, you have breached the good faith of the taxpayers, and this is likely to have a negative ramification not only to PAC, but to future county bond projects as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Wait, wait, wait. Um, did, oh, did somebody raise their hand? Oh, no, you didn't. <coughs> If you would, uh, did you sign one of the papers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you would just step to the front and start, you can stand there too if you wish and state your, your uh, name and address for the record. I've been a volunteer here at PAC since 2015. I would like to address changes to the Facebook <coughs> PAC volunteer and staff page that is a closed group page. On my 16, this addition was added to the page description. There are certain things we ask you not to post on the Facebook group page as they are better addressed with an appropriate staff person. Concerns or complaints about an issue at the shelter, complaints, suggestions, or concerns about shelter policies and procedures, <coughs> And then later it says, people may be removed from the page temporarily or permanently if they repeatedly post <coughs> inappropriate content. Staff has suggested that instead, we should email staff or talk with them in person, which I <coughs> have tried. I have sent two emails recently, and I don't usually send many emails, one on 1228 and one on 1-6. Neither was answered. Other volunteers that I have walked with or done other uh, volunteer activities with, also say often their emails are not answered. I want you to know I do not con I'm not criticizing staff for this because I know a lot of the staff and I know they work really hard and they are probably flooded with email. I am just giving these examples because I don't think this is a way that is working very well for addressing concerns. The other thing they suggested was talking to staff in person, which it worked a lot better in the old building because we knew where everybody was. We could access them. We could go to the clinic. We could find the behavioral person, the foster person, the volunteer coordinator, um, the shelter supervisor if we had an issue. But at least until phase two was completed, everyone was behind closed doors. And especially during the hours we are here, which is at least for dog walkers, we're often here early in the morning before reception is open at the clinic and knocking on the door. They're working in the back, they don't hear us. Um, and same with the people walking late at night. A lot of times the clinic is not open. During the hours when staff is here, um, a lot of times they're, behind, they're in this area behind licensing that is locked. And the only person <coughs> in licensing, at least on Saturdays when the adoption's open at 10, there is a line of people waiting to get their licenses, and I can't say to the one person example that was there the other day, can you go find Gina for me, or this person, or that person. So the people I would like to talk to have all actually been very accessible to us and very interested in our input, but right now it's very hard to get hold of it. So the, I feel like right now the most successful thing for us to get timely answers has been by addressing concerns or asking questions on the page. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move to uh, item four on the agenda, which is uh, the director's communication and uh, annual report. And I might want to just say this is, uh, to my knowledge, the first time that we have ever had an annual report that uh, came out here. <laughs> This is an act of love by a lot of people because it's only uh, the 11th, so we weren't able to get our data until early in January. Does everybody around this table have a copy of this? Okay, great. I'm going to pass out a few. This is These are hot off the presses. Um, so these are our first copy, so we'll ask that you share uh, maybe one to two people. Um, and we'll be printing more of these up, but these are just, just came out for the meeting today. So I'll go ahead and pass a few of these around. So I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, and I'll be very brief. But I want to I want to point out just a few things that happened this year because it's significant to the conversation about the facility as well. Um, our intake was at its historic lowest. 
Now, many of you who are here through the summer can hardly believe that's true, um, but it was about 16,500 animals. And just to put that into perspective, uh, just about six years ago, our intake was closer to 28,000 animals. So we've really reduced intake, and it's happened through two mechanisms. One is our community spay-neuter efforts, our TNR Community Cats program, which we are con continuing. It's in the process of transitioning from being um, funded by Best Friends to being uh, part of our regular operations here at PAC, our community spay neuter for own pets, and then thirdly, the Pet Support Center. Um, and the Pet Support Center does a lot to help defer intake, to help people take their pets. We got a grant this year, which you may or may not have heard of, called the Keeping Families Together Grant. Well, when I got here, we hadn't spent a lot of that money, and we had a fair amount of barriers to spending it. We eased up those barriers to make sure that people who had critical medical problems who were going to have to give up their pet because they couldn't afford to treat them could get access to some of these resources. And so we were able to give up the $500 to pet owners who desperately wanted to keep their animals. And this has always been an issue that's been close to my heart. I've been in a position plenty of times in my life when I couldn't have afforded if my dog had eaten a foreign body or broken a limb um, and would have potentially been in the same situation a lot of people here are. So those are two ways that we've reduced in intake and increased humane um, treatment, keeping pets in their homes in our community rather than bringing them into the shelter. And we anticipate seeing that intake trend, continuing to see intake go down, so that in a couple of years, we hope, if we continue these efforts, we won't see 700 dogs in the shelter at one time. And even though we know we'll have seasonal um, and other kinds of space issues, that we'll actually be able to manage those better through progressive community programs, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, <clears throat> Just to give you some of the big numbers, which are here on this page with this guy, um, we saved our, we calculate both our raw save rate. That includes owner requested um, euthanasia. So that's every animal noses in, noses out. We hit about 87% save rate this year. Um, if you back out the animals surrendered for euthanasia, we hit about a 91% save rate. So roughly one in 10 um, animals entering the building is being euthanized either for medical or behavioral reasons. We adopted out 9,000, about 9,164 animals, um, and we sent about 2,000 animals to rescue or shelter partners. Previously, we um, lumped all those together, so you saw a higher adoption number. Our adoption number hasn't gone down. It's just that we separated out the rescue and shelter transfer numbers um, because those are different kinds of outcomes. We returned about 1,900 uh, pets home. We sent 2,130 pets to foster homes. That was almost 1,000 more than the, the previous year. Um, that is not only increases humane treatment for those animals, but it frees that valuable kennel space. <clears throat> so our vets, our three vets, in their, in their uh, tiny little triage trailers, uh, were able to uh, spay and neuter 7,500 animals. <laughs> and perform about 2,000 specialty surgeries. Um, and we are really proud to that now they have one of the nicest, uh, most well outfitted medical clinics of any shelter that I've ever seen, and, and, in, and probably one of the nicest ones in the, in the U.S. And this was an important part of the project that Marty and Michael talk about, but PAC had a real problem of not being able to control disease, not having anywhere to isolate animals, and I certainly don't have to tell this to this group of people, You'll notice just in the time that we've been in the new shelter, we don't have to have sick animals mixed in with different diseases all put in the same room, um, and, and sick animals just sort of out among the, the population. And that's going to change even more when we complete the project. The Pet Support Center um, responded to almost 34,000 calls, and we didn't start tracking this data until April. They're up to about 7,000 calls every month. Those are people that need help. They have questions. They don't know what to do about a medical problem or a behavioral problem. They're not calling our dispatch. They're calling for help with owned animals. 7,000 people in Pima County every month are using that service. And our animal protection service responded to about 20,000 calls. In every regard, this was a record-breaking year, lowest intake, highest save rate, 
um, relative to intake, highest number of adoptions for animals placed in foster. But the really exciting part for us and what is detailed in the report is that we're really just getting started. The next six months are going to continue to be challenging as we uh, complete the project and we still have dogs housed in the tent. But there's some really cool things that are coming up next year. In addition to the Maddie's Fund investment um, of $600,000 to build this one of first of its kind comprehensive foster program, we also have a lot of other organizations wanting to offer help. Um, we're going to be a Jackson Galaxy Cat Positive Shelter. Has anybody heard of Jackson Galaxy? So he does cat clicker training to help make cats more adoptable and cat behavior. So we're going to be, they're going to bring that training to us. Um, Amy Sadler and the Dogs Playing for Life team is going to help come and help us increase play groups. Um, we just received this $250,000 investment from Petco Foundation. We're going to use that money to increase humane education efforts and community-based foster programs, just like our Alzheimer's Kitten program. So lots of great stuff is ahead. Head. And the focus for us this year, which Sarah will talk a little bit more about later, is on community programs to decrease the overall number of pets housed in the shelter at any time. That's really the name of the game for us, is programs, programs, programs. We have this incredible new facility. Now we have the work to do out in the community to keep more pets in their homes and in the community. So, thank you. And uh, it's a really exciting uh, I don't want to have time. Do you have time for questions? I have one question. <laughs> Is there any? Back and forth? No. no. Not in this minute. Okay, under uh, item number five, uh, new business. Um, in anticipation of, uh, and based on what we heard today, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the new facility, uh, both the first phase and the second phase. So uh, after discussion with uh, Dr. Garcia and Kristen um, and our facilities people, I ask that they come tonight and review uh, the phase one construction with us, where we, where we came from, where we are today, and to review, importantly, where we're going with phase two, which is under uh, uh, progress right now, so that we all know exactly uh, what is in the works and what the plans are so that we, we don't have a lot of rumors starting about what's actually going to happen over there. So if you'll bear with us, I'd like to invite our facilities and architects from Lion Space to come up and uh, share uh, that information with us. Thank you. I'm going to grab some water. Mr. Chair, as, Appreciate it. Uh, as facilities gets ready, if I could sort of make some preparatory remarks. Um, one of the things that um, is really critical for us as we think about animal welfare in this community is to think about how animal welfare really is a, is a county-wide responsibility. And, and we as PAC, uh, along with a lot of different partners, each sort of have a grain of sand or two that we carry in this space. Um, the Animal Care Center, as Kristen has talked about, um, it, it is not meant to, has been referred to as a puppy palace and a kitty Taj Mahal. Um, and it is not lost on me nor on a lot of stakeholders that, that not everybody thinks that this is the best use of resources. The Board of Supervisors and the County Administrator believe, however, that animal welfare is an important value in this community, uh, and that we believe that, that it increases the um, quality of life. Uh, and that's part of the reason that the investment has been made in the way that it has. Um, one of the things that, that as when we build public buildings, um, and uh, the chair, you, uh, Ms. Pina, uh, Mr. Ekstrom isn't here, folks who have uh, served in, in public office can sort of reflect on the public input that you get as you build the town of Oro Valley, you know, um, uh, center uh, or any other public facility. And so there are spaces and places for public input and and what, what Marty and what Mike are going to talk about um, is exactly how that has been incorporated. We're really, really, really lucky to have both Marty Clell from Facilities Management, uh, Mike Anglin from Lion Space, our colleagues from Sunt, uh, who is our, our contractor, uh, who have done a really, really fabulous job 
Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Marty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. As, as Barry said, we um, as we started to hear some of the, the chatter and discussions mm -hmm. about phase one, and a lot of the information we we're hearing wasn't accurate, or I think some of it starts with a rumor. It's kind of like the telephone game. It starts somewhere and ends up at the end. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. And we don't know really where it started. So we thought we'd back up to the beginning and kind of talk about the process as a whole, how we got here. Um, and then I'll turn over to Mike, and he's going to talk a lot about phase two and where we're going with the second phase. Um, so it's a little bit long, but um, please bear with me. And I think it's quite informative. So how did we get here? And you know, we, we had the ribbon cutting just a couple weeks ago. Um, a lot <coughs> happened in the last three years. Um, so let's, let's dive in. Starting in 2014 with the bond approval. Um, and this is important because it really is established, a lot of work was done before this, but it establishes, um, it's kind of our rules of engagement a little bit. It um, establishes the dollar amount that we have to work with. Um, what's also important is it talks about, well, the fact that we can build new, we can also renovate the existing. And so I know there were some complaints about the renovation portion, um, but the team felt it was important that we take advantage of that existing facility that, that had some good bones and been renovated in 2008, 2009. And I think the county spent almost $3 million on that piece. Um, we also had some other limitations, which I'll get into um, later on, but that was kind of our departure point from there. At that point, we went out and saw it, did a national search for a design team. We hired Land Space Architects as our local, kind of our, there are, that's who our contract with it is, and they're our go-to on this. They, they run the show as far as the design. Um, they teamed up and brought in two great consultants, Amlar's Design, which designed specifically, I know a lot of you may know this, but um, for those of you that don't, they design specifically animal shelters only. They've done over 400. They really know what they're doing. And they brought on a unique consultant, the Correct Shelter Medicine Program, which um, I believe, I mean, to say this incorrectly, but correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, they, they focus on um, shelter design, not shelter from not so much a design aspect, but how they look at the details of design as far as disease control and how they're meeting standards. I believe they write a lot of the standards that get released occasionally. So the kind of the extra set of eyes to look over the design team to see if there's anything they're doing that, that could be improved on. It's also important to know that on this selection panel, we had members of the community. Tammy was on that selection panel. We had members of PAC, we had members of the public. Uh, we had members of administration, um, so we had, we had uh, a great group and definitely selected the right consultant in my opinion. And we began design, so this was the Meet the Architect event back in September of 2015. And what's interesting here is, right from the beginning we were soliciting feedback from everybody. They had boards out there and they were asking questions, trying to get information from from the public on, on what they would what they would like in the facility, what's their wish list. And as I go through these notes, it's, it's interesting on how many of these have manifested into the building. Um, there's there's thousands of comments and I would say 90, 99% or somewhere around there um, in some form are in, this, are in this new building, whether it's phase one or will be in phase two. From there, we went into workshops, pretty intense um, sessions. Um, we met on site in the old trailer, members of PAC, we had members of the public. Hundreds of people came to these sessions. Um, I think they took a place over four days. And uh, lots of stakeholders involved from various um, jurisdictions, staff members, donors, volunteers. We also had a public forum where we met with the, the public. Um, asked some questions about what they saw in the old building they didn't like, what they'd like to see in the new building. We took notes of all this, recorded all this. Um, we did not just give this lip service. We recorded it all and, and, and took it into account in design. That generated the program, which is this document right here. And this was their starting point for design, at least starting to put pen on paper, I guess you could say. And this document are, is all that information. And, and the reason I'm showing this is just so, um, you know, we didn't put boards out there just, just to make the public and the volunteers feel like they were being heard. 
you know, they were big. And, the, and these are the things I go through that I was talking about, where it's, it's hard to find one that didn't make its way some way into the, into the project. Um, some were harder than, hard to do. Some had challenges where we just couldn't quite make it work. Um, here's all from the different sessions. And th from there, the architect started to do some analysis of all this stuff. And I put this up here because it shows how complex this facility can be. You know, at first, at first blush, it doesn't seem like that. But this diagram right here is the clinic showing you all the space relationships required to make it function correctly. And how you get this to manifest into the actual bricks and mortar is pretty challenging. And I think we did a great job of almost, even just going over this diagram today, almost every single one of these is, has been met. It's a very complex, it's very complex what they do. Um, I had no idea the complexity of it until we really dove into it. And, I, and uh, it functions quite well. Like example of this in the clinic, it's meeting all these space relationships and it's really functioning um, at a high level. Out of the programming, um, these are some of the goals and the key elements that we identified as kind of these overarching themes as we start design. These came from uh, uh, the, from the programming session, so you know. So I'll highlight a few of the big ones. You know, the, the top one to support Pax life saving operations. That was kind of a big. I mean, that was probably one of the biggest overall goals, is because without that's that was the change that Pac had years ago. Was how do we save animals? What's the, what's the vehicle to do that? How do you create a building? Tina, please dial 7225. Tina, please dial 7225. Um, another big one is, as you noticed in the phase one, the medical component is a huge piece of that. And that was driven out of the programming session that sick animals can't be adopted. So, for early on, that was a change from kind of previously for bringing on the architect, was it didn't have as big of a clinic component. And before the clinic was just in the trailer, so it really didn't have what it needed to support that. Um, indoor outdoor dog housing was an important component in there, among others. Project constraints. There's always constraints on projects. And the reason I, I put this up here is one of the challenges we have is the, is the site, the existing operation <laughs> dictates the phasing. I know that's been a challenge for PAC staff, for the volunteers. And, it, and quite frankly, it's been a challenge for the design team, too. Nobody likes to do things in phases. We'd rather do one, one build on site and be done with it. But we had this interim phase, so um, I appreciate the PAC staff and all the volunteers, everybody um, being on board with that. It's kind of what we're stuck with, though. We have the site, we have a certain size building, we have an existing building in the middle of the site. And so I think we did pretty well to accommodate some of the earlier designs before line space was hired had three phases. And I start to think back what that, how bad that would have been. And it had, a, it had an even longer construction schedule. So the design team was really creative, and I think administration was involved, involved with that as well, trying to purchase land from the park to eliminate a phase, give us more space to create two phases. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of challenges on the project. And, 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 I'll, and I'll just interject something that, that is important. So, so the, the whole sort of phasing <coughs> issue is really important because it, to a certain extent the, the phases are, are kind of artificial and cosmetic. But we needed a, a break from where we, where we uh, depopulated, not depopulated, but we left the old building and brought all of the animals over. Um, and that's why we divvied it up into two phases, where we transferred our operations into this new building, knowing that, that seven months down the road, we're going to have to repopulate this new phase two arena. So, so the way that we're using the building today and is something that, that Kristen and, and Sarah will tell you, the way that we're using it today will not be the way that we use it in six months, because because once we are able to move into that additional, it's mostly kenneling space um, and some programming space, um, you'll, you will see us sort of manage the business differently. But, but a question has been asked about why, why did we need a phase one and a phase two? Well, if we had a, if we had a, a vacant lot, it'd be easy to build from the ground up, but we didn't have a vacant lot. Uh, we were confined to the existing space 
um, and we were confined to continuing to operate while we were building. Yeah, and, and as sad as it may sound, fortunately we had the tent that we could use for that, and I know the tent is kind of the bane of people's existence, but um, it's, it's allowing us to have additional runs during this intern phase. Unfortunately, it's on the other side of the shelter, so there's big challenges there. We're, we're trying to um, improve on those. Um, but it's allowed for that. And we knew right away, or we knew during design we were going to have some challenges during phase one, and those came down to having to use the tent, lack of storage, as you can see with all the mobile minis out here, um, lack of staff space and access to staff space which I know is a challenge because quite a lot of uh, a few employees, especially ones that interface with volunteers in the public, just do not get their workspace until phase two. Uh, thankfully, we had some flexibility built into this phase to at least accommodate them, but it, are, it is a challenge. Laundry is another challenge. Um, there are about four or five of the big ones that we, that we knew would be there. And we unveiled the concept design in October of October 20th, 2015. Um, this is the concept design. And, and I was talking with Barry about this, and he was asking me some questions. And it's interesting in how little it changed. I mean, a lot happened since then, but as, a, as far as a, a sketch, um, you know, the, the overall concept stayed the same. We moved a few things around here and there, rotated a few buildings. But it's generally stayed the same since, since that date, um, just being continued to be refined. Um, as you all know, we had to do we had to get the site ready to build. So we did pre-construction work by moving the trailers up by the tent. Um, a pretty arduous task to prepare the site for the work. Meanwhile, we were designing continuously, um, meeting weekly, multiple times a week um, with PAC staff and administration and consultants, really trying to fine tune the design. And then construction began. Moved pretty quickly in retrospect. And phase one is complete and open to the public. Um, I believe that's all um, I, have. I have. I have a series of slides of the old pack just to kind of as we start to talk about what phase two is. But um, and, and I had shown this at a previous presentation because a lot of people hadn't seen what the previous. A lot of people have never been out here before and they saw the new building and they thought, "Oh, that's great!" But if you really put it in contrast to the old building, I, I think it's it's so much. It's, it's such a big improvement. You know, the old lobby, just full of people. This is the, this is the old kenneling, dog housing with all chain link, grooming in the middle of a you know, dog run space. And on the other side are where the adoptions occurred. You know, isolation is a space that was never built for isolation. It's just, this is the end of dog runs with, with chains across it saying don't enter. Cat isolation without adequate airflow, makeshift cat isolation. <coughs> you know, the old clinic and the, and the trailers, I couldn't believe when I walked in there. Um, what, was, what they were doing with what they had was amazing. <coughs> A maintenance nightmare, too. And the tent is, of course. <laughs> it was like a couple years ago. <laughs> and, the tent, and the tent panels, you know, single dog runs. But, you know, adequate but not ideal. And then we have our new shelter. So um, that's kind of history in, what, how, in a nutshell. I mean, I could go into much more detail. But I think from there, I'll turn it over to Mike England, the Lime Space Architects. And, um, you know, as, we as we, I was talking about phase two with a few people, I was amazed at how, much, how little some people knew about it. But we never really sat down and, and presented it in that much detail. Um, so we thought it would be good for you guys to hear that. We kind of. Uh, squash some of the rumors about what may or may not be in there. Um, and so, here you go, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank you. Okay, so phase two, which is in construction right now, this is one rendering we did, um, which I think the next, I'm just going to jump ahead to show just for context where we are. This is the existing central space on the main floor, which is being um, totally opened up and is now how people will access the main kennels. Um, 
one point is one row of the existing kennels were subdivided into half kennels. Um, those are being removed, and uh, all of the kennels become new two compartment kennels, which will aid cleaning. It doesn't require a dog to be removed, just like the kennels in the new pod. Um, there's huge benefits to that. Um, so that's something that we integrated in all of the indoor-outdoor kenneling and even the, the indoor Now, it's difficult to make a distinction between stray and adoptable because this, this facility was designed for an open selection model. There's benefits to that for animals as well in the sense that as soon as an animal comes in from a, as a stray over the counter from one of the citizens or off of the, an ACO truck, if we can, if that animal is deemed adoptable, it can't be yet because of the mandatory stray hold period, but if it doesn't have a medical or, or immediately apparent behavior issue, we can park that animal in one place and it can stay there during its mandatory period and then it's just a matter of putting an A on the kennel card and it becomes adoptable. So this facility doesn't make the distinction and the calculation for capacity that corrected and that we use in design doesn't necessarily have a hard distinction between stray and adoptable. So that being said, all of the, the kenneling that was on the main floor, Harry's Haven of course remains, and the new uh, the old front, which is now sort of the back, uh, runs, which were remodeled in 2009, are still there, are getting a facelift again, and that will become the, the puppy and small dog. Room. So, so if we, if, if I may interject for a second, that picture that you just showed us, uh, basically that entryway into the old kennel uh, area is where, if, if you think about where, uh, customer service was. Yeah. Uh, and you go out the glass doors here in the new building, they're going to knock that wall out so you'd be entering from the south. So, so that whole thing would be opened up. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to run through this bullet point and then I think I'm going to jump back to the plane to explain where they are. So some of the features of the new phase two are LED lighting, more natural light. We're punching holes in the exist through the existing structure to get natural light into that main floor. Um, one big thing that really impacted people's experience and staff and volunteers as well was the acoustics. There was no mitigation of the, the barking on that main floor kenneling space. So we're handling that in two ways. We're dropping in these clouds which have the highest NRC, which is the noise reduction coefficient, available in an area with, with uh, high moisture since the kennels are being hosed down. And then above that, where we don't have these clouds, we're putting in even higher NRC material where it won't be subject to spraying. Um, so the hope is it's really going to, to dampen down. Um, what was the term? A cloud? A cloud, yes. So, and you can see here, you can see here this cloud. We're also using it as, as a sort of architectural tool to define um, wayfinding and where the public access and circulate versus the staff because that's another thing that we focus a lot is pathway planning and really wanted to have a clear user experience so someone coming here had a, a, an easy experience as they circulate through the facility to find a dog. We've got a lot of kennels, we've got a lot of dogs, but we wanted to make, make that as user friendly as possible. So you can see in this rendering here, there are going to be areas where the, that existing concrete double T structure will still remain exposed, um, but it's going to be all cleaned up. It's getting that acoustic treatment, and we're, we're painting it all, so it will be refreshed. Um, all of the chain link is gone already. You'll see when we show some photos that Marty took um, today and over the past few days, will be replaced with new um, kennel fronts and tops in some cases and sides um, that are the same type and material as the pods that are already completed in phase one. And that includes an opaque section. 
one thing that we um, that was an existing challenge is the the kennels facing each other. The way that we are addressing that is by having a solid section, just as we did in the new pods, where an animal has an, an area of refuge, basically. If it doesn't want to be seen, it cannot be seen um, by animals across the way. Um, I already mentioned that all of these are going to go to two-sided runs. With the new system, we're going to be uh, six foot three in the door, so they're even on kennels that have tops on them, there won't be any ducking in like the old. I mean, I, I'm sure it's happened to everyone that, that walks dogs. You think you're used to it and you still bang your head or rip your shirt on the chain. Um, so those days are over. It's not going to happen anymore. Um, the other thing that, that we had a lot of consideration with design and discussions with PAC, going back to Perret and trying to understand it's a huge benefit that Harry's Haven is sort of out there by itself. It's an ideal place. It was an ideal place for isolation. Luckily, we have new proper isolation space, so we won't have to use it for that. But for, for animals that are highly kennel reactive, and maybe this uh, hiding spot isn't enough for them, Harry's Haven will be available at the end of phase two to, to park those animals and, you know, candidates for the decompression program or other uh, training issues. Already talked about acoustical treatment. Touched a little bit on circulation wayfinding, which I'll show you in the plan and rendering. And um, better visibility and access to PAC staff. That's, that is related to the point of a lot of the staff and the staff that these volunteers interact with mostly, the life saving operations, the Gina, um, shelter supervisors. Um, don't have their desks yet. They don't have their offices yet. So that is something that's coming as well. I'm going to go back to the plan just for a quick orientation. <coughs> this is the entry plaza. This is the adoption lobby. This is the old administration wing where law enforcement and the adoptions lobby was. That is all gone as of Friday, and um, we are totally reorienting how people will approach and circulate through. So the pathway that leads out of adoption interviews will lead into the new building. The old, old triage before triage moved up to the, the tent, and uh, Tamsin was the last one occupying that space, I believe. That all gets sort of blown out and becomes a breezeway. It's a direct extension to where the doors out of the adoption lobby are. And we're capping off that breezeway with glass and the end is also totally open and glass, which leads to this very large exercise play training yard and a landscape area. Now, so that's how people, versus how they used to come in to the front room, how the public will now access the existing building when they come here to, to look for their new family. <coughs> One thing that we're doing along those lines also is trying to control to aid wayfinding where staff is and where the public is. So as I mentioned, each one of these is intended for a single occupant, a dog, but they are, they have the sliding panels so that, um, it, you know, we don't have to remove a dog while, while cleaning and there's a pee, there's a chill outside and a pee and poop side, for lack of a better term. Um, and that's where we're putting the service circulation for staff, the central pet if they need to clean kennels, and then the public is on the other side. So the idea with this is you can come in and make one single loop and see every adoptable dog that's housed on that meeting. The way that we're achieving that is by having these big sliding panels, which is something that you, I'm going to jump ahead to the render real quick. You see here, so when we're here early, before hours, all of those panels can be slid back, central tech can be cleaning, volunteers can be walking, it can all be flowing just like it was before. But when it comes time to open to the public, 
Those panels can be slid shut, and they're intentionally designed to not look like doors. So people won't be inclined to slide them open and see what's back here. You know, they don't have lock sets or handles or deadbolts. They are, um, you know, they look, they're going to look like a wall essentially. And we saw it as a real opportunity to um, do some exciting things with graphics, to, to recognize donors perhaps that have donated to Friends of PAC. So that's something that's not fully um, developed yet, but it's a real opportunity to bring some life and excitement into, <coughs> into this space, um, which you know felt like a rabies control facility, which is what it was built for. So one thing that we're doing is putting small dogs and puppies in the old uh, front room. It's an ideal place for them because it's sort of at the end of the road and it's quiet. That's also a marketing strategy because we want the people that saw the small dog on the internet to come here and fall in love with the pit bull. So we're making them, we're making them walk through all of the larger, older dogs too. And you guys remember we did that in the old facility too, like putting the, the long timers up here on the end caps of there. So we're taking that sort of to the end degree by pushing our most desirable population furthest away and making people circulate through all of the other animals that they might not know they're wanting. Um, again, I talked about Harry's Haven being out here. It's a really ideal location for decompression dogs. Um, it can also flex. Um, if there is ever any sort of disease outbreak, a big amount of compartmentalization, especially you see that in the new facility with all the separated isolation rooms, you know, those aren't defined necessarily for one given illness. The idea is that it's more about separating and containing. Um, on the human side, the, all of the old cat space, um, well not all of it, most of the old cat space becomes a volunteer break room and Gina will also have a sort of landing pad in there for office hours or, or a, a touch point with volunteers. There will be workstations in there for volunteers that are, are volunteering on things like data entry or graphics or, or whatever will have a dedicated space to work. Lockers are in there. We're trying to get lockers that will have integrated cell phone chargers in them because for people that are here, you know, for the whole adoption shift and, um, you know, oftentimes need to charge their phone. There'll be a TV in there, a couch. Um, it's really going to feel like a lounge and um, be a nice space to get some relief for those long hours that people are here. The old cat room that was right at the entry will become a dog meet and greet room that could also has the potential to become um, a uh, it's one of three in the building that will be proper inside um, meet and greet rooms unlike the little cage that was in the corner here it's a room where you can go you're separated from the, from the other dogs in their kennels and um, I think that all three of these have the potential to become something like a real life room too. Um, the existing bathroom will stay, the shower is going away, um, but the bathroom will stay and it's directly adjacent to the volunteer break room so it'll be there. Um, I know that it's a trek <laughs> right now and we're, we have porta potties up at the tent but that situation is going to be better. Um, this whole block here, which used to be, um, you know, years ago it was the sort of intake lobby, customer service, and live release, that all becomes life-saving operations, that block. And it, it is fronted with glass onto that breezeway that I was talking about. So as you're walking, and you have these glass fronts that are drawing you in along this main access, you also have full height glass that's looking into these offices, which is life savings operations on the south and the shelter supervisors on the north. So that's going to make staff um, a lot more accessible, not only to volunteers, but to the public or other visitors that need to interface. Um, back in here in old euthanasia, uh, well, old euthanasia becomes the IDF and a storage room. 
Uh, the room next to that becomes a dishwashing. So this, the remodeled facility will gain an additional co commercial pass-through dishwasher, just like the one that's already in phase two and or in phase one, and the phase one will remain. So in the end, we'll have two. Um, the laundry room is getting totally redone, and the two with two brand new washers and two new dryers that are way upsize in capacity. The old ones were um, something like 55 and 65 pounds. That's how you measure laundry. Um, the new ones are 85 pounds each for the washer and 120 pounds each for the dryers. Um, there's two of those additional meet and greet rooms. So this is the old puppy room. Part of that becomes mechanical, electrical rooms. But we're taking advantage of this north side and the nice light and the windows that are in there and putting two um, meet and greet rooms. There's a sort of outpost uh, exam room so that an animal won't necessarily have to be trekked all the way over to the clinic if it's having a medical issue. Someone from the veterinary staff can pull a dog into that exam room and check it out. And then, um, which isn't reflected in this plan because it's changed, um, a, a dedicated space for Tamsin and what she does as far as uh, training and evaluation. Um, all old pet support center and old, old Sally Port becomes uh, storage space. So that's gonna, uh, you know, all the stuff that's temporarily in mobile menus will have a, a home when the remodel is done. So that's sort of a general orientation. And um, materials wise, which, you know, the, the detail, the rendering's not detailed enough to show it, but as I mentioned with the kennel fronts, same with the flooring, same with the epoxy, all of that is being redone. The old floor is gonna be stripped down. All of those layers of paint that isn't appropriate for animal housing is gonna be stripped back and it will get the same level of finishes as the new phase one facilities do, which are high performance epoxy on the vertical surfaces and this coved cementitious urethane, uh, which is virtually bulletproof, not only within the kennel, but also in the walkway, um, because that entire floor surface is gonna be um, blasted. Um, solid section for hiding. We have glass up on top for when you're standing, you have a nice unobstructed view of the animal. It doesn't feel like it's behind chain link or in jail. But we wanted to maintain the, the potential for interaction. Um, you know, dogs licking your fingers is one of the things that makes you fall in, in love with them. So we maintain that for the bottom half. Except for the puppy and small dog room, where we'll have full height glass because we're much more concerned about disease control with that population. Um, So here are some views of what's happening as we sit here. Um, this is old triage. You can see they've already opened it up. One thing that I actually really like about this is it was an existing opening before. You guys remember it had a high window in that room that you could see from the outside and then it was filled in with masonry. That was... Um, that used to be where. Yeah, it used to be where trucks would would back in, and this is you know way back when. But um, where trucks would back in, the park was a much different place. Um, so one thing that I really like about this change is, um, you know, we're really trying to transform it into a welcoming space for people to come and get excited about being here and finding a new family member. So um, that's happening. In about three weeks, the, the holes are going to be punched in the, the ceiling. So we'll start to get a sense of what that natural light is going to feel like on that main floor. Um, finishes are going to continue to be stripped down so that the new ones can go on. So this is what it looks like from the outside. And you can see what I was talking about. Hopefully 
with the idea of that strong circulation axis pulling you through the entire building and we're planting a nice tree here at the end. So even in a space like this, we're still gonna have a nice connection to nature, which is something that we try and do for all of our users in all of our projects. Um, this, this shows you where the lobby was. Um, not there anymore. Um, this face of the building is getting insulated, so um, we're going to see a big operational benefit as far as energy conservation because we're insulating it and then treating it with the same corrugated metal. So the new and the old are going to tie together. Our real goal was that someone coming here that wasn't familiar with the old facility wouldn't realize that it was a remodel. You know, they would circulate through and see the brand new housing and they would see the housing that is the, the core of it, the main structure, may be more than 60 years old, but it's going to have the same level of finishes um, as the brand new. So, yes, volunteers and people who have been here and remember what it's like, you know, they'll, they'll know that it's, it's an old building. But the, the real hope is, and we put a lot of design effort and budget into making this feel feel new and be new in the areas where that we consider most important, which is the animal housing space. So here already you can see it was so bizarre. Um, as someone who's been volunteering here for for years, um, to enter this space and not hear all the parts. <laughs> Um, but it was exciting too because it means that we're moving forward with this last part of, of completion. And I think that that's one thing that's been hard to grasp even for me. This phase one is not the end of the project. Um, it's an important milestone um, and as, as Dr. Garcia said, they're not using the building at, fully as it was intended to yet because we're having to shoehorn things in and accommodate not having all of the talent and other staff places. But this gives you a sense of what's been torn out already. All of this is going to be new and fresh with, with great new finishes. Those clouds are going to go in. To clean all of this up, it's going to feel much less um, industrial. Um, this is the old puppy room. This is that area that I was talking about where Tamsin gets a part of it, and there's two meet and greets that are going to take advantage of these windows. And then this is just an overall view of what happened on Friday with, with um, taking all of that down. And you can see now that it's gone, um, it's eliminated some of the awkwardness between old and new because the old building felt really close. And, and you can actually see um, a lot of the things worked out to the benefit of the design, but the cat room, the cat spaces really had to be designed around that existing transformer and the power line and, and keeping maintaining a safe distance away from this building that was still being occupied. But you now that that's tomorrow, yay! <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 So and actually that's a, that's another thing too that Mark didn't mention. There are there is a high number of plants that were salvaged before the archaeology even started, and some out before we built that temporary ACO um, parking lot, um, and those went to um, the Pima County Native Plant and were used on other projects, and then a lot of the vegetation for this project was purchased from them, so it's kind of a closed loop, um, not with the exact same physical plant, but with, with the idea of taking away and preserving and then bringing back. So, the tent. That's the, the big thing, too, at this time, uh, you know, before monsoon season is, is what we're really trying for. Um, the, the tent will come down and be gone. It's a nice flat area, so it's going to be a great um, overflow parking. So we're going from not having enough parking by far to maybe having too much parking, but I guess we'll take that. Um, there's a view of what it looked like today. This photo is from today. Right? Yes, this morning. Yeah. So that's the end. I wish. Um, 
we could have Q&A, um, but I'm going to respect the, <laughs> the operating uh, rules of the body. Um, but I will be in attendance at the upcoming volunteer sort of roundtable next week. That's on the 18th. So um, we can have some more back and forth then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee or staff? I, I have a lot of stuff to say. <laughs> okay. Um, Me? Okay. Um, I, everything that I've been hearing is we've got some problems in phase one. I have I have no idea that phase two was going to be so remarkable. I, I just can't believe it. It's I mean I think if we can just work on some of the problems that we're having. <coughs> communication by the time we get into phase two, we're going to be running like a clock. A, a really fine-tuned engine. I, I'm so happy that you did this presentation. It solves so many of the questions that I've had and I think hopefully it'll solve some of the problems that you guys are having. Because when you stick everything in that one building and think how much is going to come out and go back into that building, it's going to be, it is going to be a Taj Mahal. It's going to be wonderful. But yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so proud. I really am. Thank you. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm still a little uh, resistant to the idea of Taj Mahal because we well, did do, yeah. you know, we were, we did have a tight budget on this project, as, as, um, um, I, you know, I, I provided numbers to administration of how this facility on a square footage cost compares to other, even municipal facilities, and we did achieve it at a much uh, lower budget than a lot of our counterparts. So um, it's still remarkable. And what we did is we focused on the areas of the animals. So yes, it was frustrating for me as someone who cared a lot about PAC for the project was even the project um, that we had to reuse the building that we were getting on. But it was the right choice to maintain the the capacity that we need. So can't go into that now, but <laughs> I'm happy to have that conversation. Okay, we okay, thank you. Any other questions from the committee members? I had a question. Um, you didn't mention the training plans, how the training is going to be incorporated. Um, one of the biggest issues with disease control and the old shelter was the open pit. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So the new um, the new sliding panel. I'm really trying not to say you anymore. Um, <laughs> the new transfer door um, will be the full width, which may address concerns for that some of you may have about larger dogs being able to come. It will be the full width of the kennel, and it includes a what TriStar the manufacturer calls a resting bench um, that will fold over on top and have a pin to lock it down so you know my dog at home right now would be able to flip that up and you'd be in there so it's going to be a flip down panel that locks down so it can be kicked up while while um, central pet or staff is washing to allow access to that trench drain but it will be sort of covered up and not accessible to animals at all so the original drain will still stay in place yes and those the, the entire drainage system, the trench drains and the clean, the basin at the end, was part of the 2009 improvements. So we did a thorough analysis and study of that and talked to facilities management about what, if any issues they were having, and it all is actually working well. Yes, being open and transferring from one side to the other was an issue for disease control, <coughs> but as far as actually functioning um, with regard to, to flow of waste, it is a pretty solid system. So luckily we didn't have to spend bond money to address that, but we are spending bond money to cover it up to not make it accessible. Um, the burning question, are there people that overall, it's really confusing when you read the documents and you look at the pictures, um, for adoptable or for any, for total panels, <coughs> are, we, are we at a net loss? Are we more? No. Are we we uh, one of our Q&As that we have posted online says we're going from 278, I think, units, <coughs> housing units, to 400 and something. Correct. That's and that's where we're a little we're a little bit less than that, but we did not take that away from stray or adoptable housing. We took it away from this side <coughs> in the sense that we 
flexed some of our disease isolation and quarantine custody. So we did, in the course of design, as we were dealing with the realities of budget, have to reduce the raw number of kennels, but we made it as a strategic decision, looking at the population and thinking, okay, PAC operationally can deal with sharing one room that may, you know, that was originally designed to be two rooms, one just for disease isolation and one for quarantine custody animals. Now it's more of a flex. You know, if there's more quarantine custody, it becomes a QC room. If there's more um, disease or we're dealing with an outbreak, it becomes a disease room. I hope is those two things never happen at the same time. Um, but yes, net overall, we are up. Um, the, we're running around um, 369, and the existing main floor, front room, Harry's Haven, and the tent was 229 or 200, something, something around that. And we're right there in that range for adoptable, and the thing to, for adoptable trip. And the thing to remember is, included in that number that I just gave you was Giardia dogs, um, uh, other dogs that weren't adoptable, um, Biter Row, which was on the main floor and now has its own dedicated space far from public access. So. Overall, we are a net gain of close to 100 housing units. Um, we have much more holding units um, in the sense that we have um, ACO holding. We have back in here, we have dedicated holding spaces for pre and post triage. We're not even counting those. Even though they're kennels and they're built, they're not two compartment, but they're built the same as these. We don't count those in a housing calculation because they're really just a dog is parked there for, you know, hopefully not too long at all before it's moving on to its final destination. In addition to all of the pre post op ICU housing that's in the clinic bubble. So, yes, we are, I guess the takeaways are we are in that game versus the old facility, even including the tent. Through value engineering, which was necessary because of the realities of the budget. We maintained our originally programmed and intended adoption housing capacity number, adoption straight housing capacity number. <coughs> and what was the third point about it? Maybe those, maybe that's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's definitely confusing here to put them all in the room. Yeah. Well, and there's, and there's also all the, like Mike said, the miscellaneous housing. There's caging here and there. There's a holding area here and there. And it's all over the place, and so how do you count numbers? There's flexibility built in. You can drop, you can drop transfer doors, and all of a sudden, a two side rooms becomes two. It's not best practice, but that, a lot of that was done in, in the existing mm -hmm. facility. So there's lots of when we put numbers out there. That we try to be cautious with them because it's, it's, it's a complex. And that's one thing that 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 Corette helped us, and that's really their focus. That's why they do consulting for architects and facilities. They're all about right sizing. You know, the shoot from the hip approach is you look at your highest intake, you look at your highest population, and that's how many kennels you build. The reality is, if we did that for PAC, we couldn't have afforded it. We wouldn't have had a project because the bond just wasn't enough money for what it takes to build that many kennels. But it's also not good stewardship of the taxpayers because that means, except in that peak Worst case scenario where you're high, high population and you have an impound, um, you have wasted space, you have empty kennels. So it's all about right sizing and trying to hone in on a magic number, if you will, that 90% of the time is going to be enough. Yes, there's 10% of the time where you do have to maybe do things like drop guillotines and keep dogs or go to a higher percentage of co-housing than you maybe intended. But that is taken into to Corret's calculation. So when we say we have 385 housing units, Corret tells us in the program, which I believe is ha, has been available since it was complete, um, it says 385 housing units, and then it says in parentheses that's intended to house up to 440 dollars. Yes. Yeah. Are we talking when we talk about kennel? Are we talking about cats and dogs? 
Um, I'm just focusing on dogs. Oh, um, okay. The cat situation is hollowly beautiful. We, were pro we, we programmed at a time before PAC had its partnerships um, in place with um, PetSmart. And, and TNR was up and running. So, um, really, we are worst case scenario where we can handle anything that's coming from Catalyze, which is why we, we have been able to. Um, you know, at least for those first couple of weeks, say, okay, this is a cat room, but we're going to use it for small dogs and puppies because the demand wasn't there. Um, and that's one thing to note too. There's no no cats in uh, phase two. Also, all the cats have all of their spaces as of the completion of phase one, and they're totally separate <coughs> from a housing standpoint and from a circulation pathway planning standpoint from canines into the system. So we have um, housing for about housing units for about 140, which is intended to hold up to 170 cats, um, not including disease isolation and things like that. Um, which, for those of you that don't know, back buried in the building here, we have dedicated rooms for Khaleesi, Ringworm, and URI. In addition to Flex, there's dedicated spaces that are just for TNR night drop-off and TNR pre-post-off, so they can be mixed in with the population. Um, so cats, cats are really in a good situation because uh, we sort of designed when things were much worse for cats here, and That's they've awesome. gotten so much better. <laughs> Dr. Garcia? Um, the, the, the other piece that I will add in, is that you know, when, when we started this project, one of the things that, that we wanted to make sure was that we were meeting or exceeding industry standards. And, and part of that came from a demand from our stakeholders, from volunteers, from our rescue groups that said you needed to do, you needed to do that. But part of the reason why we invested in the consultants that we did, and part of the reason why Correct um, Animal Arts, I'm sorry, Correct uh, Shelter Medicine Program, which is the premier <coughs> shelter medicine program in the country, um, and Correct uh, and Animal Arts were engaged as part of this project because we wanted to get a group of external stakeholders, uh, external experts who could sort of give us honest input about the kinds of decisions that we were making. For Line and Space, we are their first shelter. <coughs> uh, we're lucky because, because Mike has been so involved in, as a volunteer, he has such an intimate and insider knowledge about our operation that it, it really is actually extremely unique. But having said that, it, this, is, this is their first uh, shelter. Uh, and so we were really focused on <coughs> making sure that all the right talent was at the table. And, and I feel so strongly that we made the, I wasn't part of the selection committee, but that the selection committee made the right choice when they selected Light and Space and the consultants to conduct this project, and when we selected the contractor to move it forward. Because I think that has been a unique alignment of, of talents, both local and external. Everything we're do here at PAC is a combination of, of local talent, local expertise, local spirit and, and guts uh, with external resources, external expertise, external sets of eyes. Um, and I think that this is a, a really good project. Could we have just blown the old building? Absolutely. We could have, um, but given the amount of budget that we had, that we had dedicated for phase two, we could not house nearly the number of animals that we are going to be able to house when the project is completed. Um, the, the final comment that I will make is that I am infinitely grateful to, to, to Mike and, and to Marty who have really sort of shepherded this along and, and I know I've been a pain in, in their behinds. Uh, I know that um, Kristen and, and the PAC team have have um, also sort of borne a, a lot of brunt of, of sort of the scrutiny that, that, that we provide to them. Um, but I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done. I'm very proud of where we're going to be in seven months. Um, and I think that this is going to be a, a game changer.
Thank you. I have one more question. Um, is there, are, are we putting a sound system in, uh, yes. in the camels? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Basically, everything that the new building gets, the old camels get. Okay, and the, we, finish, the, the finish, the decorating finish, is that going to be... Um, on the side that faces, on the side that faces the park and sort of the north yeah. side, that will remain as is. We considered painting it just to give it a facelift, but then it becomes a long-term maintenance. Once you paint brick, mm -hmm. you've got to be painted. Mm -hmm. That's one reason we don't paint it here where we don't need it. You know, this is a maintenance-free for the county, which essentially means it's maintenance-free for the taxpayer. I just want to say one one brief thing. Um, because there are so many volunteers in the room, we are holding a volunteer meeting that will be very similar to this one, sort of outlining the project to a larger group of volunteers. But one of the concerns that we've heard the most about is that areas are now off, off limits to volunteers, particularly the medical and the bike quarantine areas. And this is in line with best practices in sheltering. We had a problem. We had too many people having access to sick and potentially dangerous animals, and it was a safety issue on a number of levels. However, we also have a volunteer program that's going to adapt and grow to this new facility. So we plan, Gina and I plan to train special groups of volunteers to work in both of those areas. Um, and we envision a volunteer program that's much more based on specialty volunteer programming um, than it is now. I think from my six months here, I think why a lot of our volunteers are so, feel so overwhelmed and stressed so many of the time is that you walk in and you're responsible for a thousand animals. And you walk out the door at night and you know that you're leaving behind 800 that you haven't even seen. And with this new shelter, we're going to be able to train our volunteers into specialty areas so that you come and you care for the 50 animals. Maybe you work in the medical area and you have access to that area. Maybe you work in quarantine. Maybe you work on the main floor. But you you <coughs> that population of animals and you get to go home from your shift knowing that you helped that group of animals. So our volunteer program is also going to involve, evolve with this new model so that it's not that those animals are off limits. It's that we're going to make sure people have the training, um, the safety training, the medical training they need to be in those areas. Can I make a comment? Uh, Kristen, do you have a question? All right, I'll make, if that's all right. Fine. Um, first of all, I want to thank Marty and Mike. I think everybody who's been here for the few years will remember, I'm so glad you have that book with all the suggestions and, I mean, that's fabulous, because it just seems like a hundred years ago that we were writing on the yellow stickums, and to have that as a reminder is great. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Um, I, I'm going to need to move along, okay. because we're running more? out of time, and we have three more agenda items, unless you have something really pressing. And I was remiss to tell everyone here that under the Arizona meeting law, open meeting law, we're not allowed to engage with you on any topic unless it's specifically identified on the agenda for a future meeting because we might preclude someone from the public from having an opportunity to speak. That's why we can't talk to you tonight. I'm taking notes, and you're always welcome to come back. Hopefully we'll get it on the agenda, or you may call any of us to ask, and we can talk about it. Okay, thank you very much. And my last um, comment yes. is, Pat, it's not a Taj Mahal. We came in on budget and on time, and for our taxpayers and our investors, that's the important thing right now. And I wanted to say, and I know many of you... Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Our, my, my peers, us volunteers, I'm a Tucson native. Politics in the community at the time that this bond passed didn't look good for... And, and it was the only bond that passed. And Pima County was playing a tough chess game on how much money they could ask for. Maybe we should have asked for more. Maybe we would have gotten it turning the results that we ended up seeing, but we didn't know that at the time. So I think we need to keep that in perspective with the economic situation of Tucson compared to other areas and where we were at the time and our responsibility to the taxpayers as well. Okay? So I need to move because we don't have that much time left. Staffing and organizational updates. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Very brief. Um, I'll be bringing an updated organizational chart next month. Um, we're working with the communications office on that. Um, we are in the process of hiring about 15 vacancies. Uh, those are a combination of new positions and existing positions. Uh, for example, uh, Michelle back here moved into an operations manager role, so we're hiring the clinic coordinator. 
Uh, we are also hiring the three foster care positions. Thanks to the Petco Foundation um, grant, we're going to be able to hire someone to just focus on the um, Alzheimer's Memory Care Facility Program and growing our partnerships with residential facilities. So um, we're in all of those hiring processes. Some of the challenges that we've had internal promotions. So people have moved from one area to another. Um, so we're now hiring the positions that they vacated. And so um, we're anticipating the conclusion of this round of processes before we get really busy. Our goal is to have most of them done by early March so that we can get those people trained up um, by the end of March when we get busy. One key position I'll mention, which you've heard us talk about before, uh, is the field services program manager. That's currently in recruitment. We're scheduling interviews for that position now. That's another really key organizational position. They're going to be equivalent to Michelle on the organizational chart. They're going to oversee all of our life-saving operations programs, but all of the community programs as well that we're talking about, helping to build these bridges and connections in the community. I had the opportunity to meet with um, the school superintendent um, this week. Um, and we're talking about how we start getting basic human education into our local schools. So those are the kinds of things that are ahead for this year. And those staff members are going to be really key to moving those initiatives forward. Kristen, could you mention uh, what uh, we do with that training? I was going to let Sarah do that. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't want to steal her clothes. And I would just like to add to that on the staffing that uh, uh, Dr. Garcia and the county manager and uh, Jan Lesher have been very supportive and the new positions that we're starting to see the benefit from came from uh, their uh, agreement to moving forward uh, with helping us with that. And so we're going to keep going. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chair, a, a tiny side comment. One of the things that you'll notice is that, again, we have uh, <coughs> keeping kind of with the overall theme of, of moving us into the future, PAC 2.0, um, you will see our leadership is changing and we have a mix of, of established local leaders um, as well as a lot of folks, a lot of faces from out of town uh, who are bringing in significant talent and significant new sets of eyes that that in combination with the local wisdom I believe will move us forward to where we need to be. Um, you know, Adam was our first big sort of hire from from out of state, and subsequently we've, we've done quite a few others, but but I think that it's really important um, to to add that to our existing talent pool, people like Michelle, people like Gina, who um, and and I think together this mix of, of experiences and talents will really move us forward, and and that is no better exemplified than than in the person of person whom I thank God every day accepted the position that I offer. <laughs> thank you. Are you still, are we still on, a, did you have more to say about staffing? Okay. Um, operational priorities and directions January through June. I, uh, when uh, uh, Sarah walked in the door almost the first day when I ran into her, I said, uh, uh, I got a lot on the plate for you in terms of, uh, you know, operational procedures and things that we need to get done to the but I, asked her at the ribbon cutting if she would be so kind as to uh, give us uh, kind of an overview of where they see us going in the next six month uh, vision and you know kind of goals and objectives kinds of things. So with that I'm going to turn it over to Sarah please. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm Sarah Aguilar. I haven't had <coughs> the pleasure of meeting probably 35-40% of you yet, um, although you've probably seen my name somewhere. Um, I have been here for a month now. <laughs> feel uh, ready to to kind of share some things with you. I'm, I'm very thankful that I was asked to uh, or given the opportunity to do this. Um, when Barry asked me the, was it a week ago, two weeks ago, to do a little presentation today, um, I immediately started thinking of all these things. What do I want to talk about? And writing this, this presentation. And, and this morning as I was getting ready, um, I'm overthinking all of this stuff. And I'm like, okay, i got to stop thinking about this, right? So I put on this podcast. It's a new podcast that Tim Ferriss has. It started in like November. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are 
familiar with who Tim Ferriss is. He's an entrepreneur. He's um, an author. He's an investor in a lot of um, tech companies. And he wrote this book called The Four Hour Work Week, which sounds amazing, right? Like, how do we get there? Um, so he's got this new podcast, and it's called, uh, I'm going to forget. Oh, I don't think I wrote it down. Um, it's called like Tribe of Mentors, right? So, so it's, it's like I'm going to start listening to this and figuring out how to not just surround myself by mentors, but how to become one. And I'm listening to his introductory episode, and he's talking about the goals of the podcast and what he's going to cover and all of this. And I'm not really listening. I'm getting ready for work. And all of a sudden, he says this phrase, and I stop. He says, what would this look like if it was easy? Mm. What would this look like if it was easy? What does sheltering look like if it's easy? What does work look like if it's easy? And I, and I get all sidetracked, and I'm instantly I'm in my head, and I'm thinking of a hundred things. Everything that I know about sheltering, everything that I've learned in the four weeks I'm here, and... I realize I have, to, I have to express this to all of you today. And it's not that I didn't already have a plan, I didn't already have stuff to talk about, but it encapsulated sort of my vision and what my focus is going to be. So, um, I've previously worked for organizations where they have kind of a different day policy where changes are made um, because somebody runs up to you and says, this is a problem. You go, okay, we're going to fix it like this. And you don't think of how that affects everything else. You don't think about long term. You don't think of the effects. You don't think of the person that works 12 offices over now has to change what they do. And you don't tell them because you're not thinking about them. You're just thinking about this fire that's here right now. And I don't want us to be there. I don't want to work for an organization like that. I don't want to be part of an organization like that. Um, so my focus is on creating structure, on creating policies, on being proactive. We know that someday we're going to have a 50 cat hoarding case come in. So let's not wait until we do to figure out what the, how to deal with it. Let's figure it out now. Um, there's some things that I've already started to put into place. <coughs> One of them is a daily rounds. Um, we're taking somebody from the foster program. We're taking somebody from um, the, the medical clinic. We're taking somebody from marketing. We're taking somebody from uh, behavior. And we're all getting together and we're going to look at every animal that's here. And we're looking at what's their behavior, what's their health, how do, we, how do we move them out of here, what's the next step, what is the next thing that this animal needs right now. For some, they don't need anything. They've been here for two days, they're still on a stray hold, they're super cute and fluffy, they're three months old, somebody's going to come adopt them. Um, but there's others that they're starting to break down emotionally, they're starting to break down mentally, physically. Um, and hoping that we can catch those early. What's the next step to get this animal out of here? Does it need a foster plate? Does it need a photo? Does it need a video? Does it need uh, some medical something? Um, and really be in the shelter and not behind the desk. Um, it helps us to identify things like this kennel is broken, the lighting in this this particular space is off. It's cold in this place. This space has everything it needs. It's perfect. Um, and start to try and evaluate um, and be aware of, of everything that's going on in our facility on a daily basis. Um, and having all different eyes and viewpoints together simultaneously. Um, you may have Caught when Mike mentioned that in phase two, there's an exam room or an exam type space. Um, one of the pieces that 
having a medical person in rounds is, is that if there's something wrong with an animal that we didn't know about, it can be identified on the spot, be checked out. And um, we're lucky enough that we have a local donor who is going to allow us, who's provided a gift that's going to allow us to hire a fourth vet and two techs. <laughs> and their focus is going to be on helping to deal with these issues that are coming up on a daily basis um, out on the floor. Um, I think for me, one of the big focuses, for sure, is just making sure that we have thorough and clear communication, um, not just within the organization, but also to all of our external partners, um, our volunteers, our rescues, um, our advisory committee, our board, all of the people that, that care about what happens here and um, that need to know. And that if we can look at how to make this easy and how to keep everybody going the same direction, we're not just becoming a more efficient organization that's saving money, that's doing things um, in a timely manner, but we're also saving more lives. And um, I think that's probably why we're all here. I have just one. When you talked about the group, uh, the people that are going to be doing the walkthroughs, yes, you're not doing all. It's not all of you at the same time, right? Yes, it's all of us together. Oh, geez, really? Yes. Good job. Yeah. And we're we're getting through. We can. We're doing one hour a day. Um, we don't go over an hour, so it's whatever we get through in an hour. Um, we're at the point now where we can complete the entire tent in one hour. We can complete the three pods in one hour. Um, and as we get better at this, we get to see more animals each day. That's what I'm Thank you. Item E, a 5E on the agenda is uh, intake after hours and night coverage. Uh, Gail Smith requested this. I uh, just wanted to uh, congratulate Gail for being one of our uh, volunteer walkers. Yay, yay, yay. And a couple of volunteers, in the I woke up in the morning and a couple of volunteers asked me to bring this up because it happened to me and it's happened to other people. I know Kristen, you helped somebody who came in yeah. like at 6 or 6, 7 o'clock with a delicious animal that needed to be euthanized yeah. or needed to be cremated. But, and you were able to point them in the right direction. But we've, I've also had, and this is in a short period of time, by accident come across good Samaritans who found a stray and brought their stray to pack at 7 o'clock in the morning, and pack's not open. And they didn't know what to do. And I was able to come in and I grabbed somebody and said, I don't know what to do. This person has to And it happened to be two people right at the same time. So I don't know if we are going to have new signage out now that the new pack is open and people are coming in droves to see it, and I think more good Samaritans will bring dogs here if they find them, especially if people are on the way to work or taking their kids to school. Mm -hmm. It's before the official pack is open. If we can come up with a plan to make it easier for these good people to bring a dog in and not have to try to come back at 12 o'clock or try to figure out who's, what to do with this dog, like that couple who put the two dogs in Harry's age at that night, because they didn't know what to do. I think we need to have a plan, and we need signage to help people who show up at 7 o'clock in the morning. Because a lot of the volunteers aren't even up front. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the dog walkers are in the back walking dogs, um, and most of the door, doors are locked. So I don't know what you have as a contingency plan, but you need some signage or something to make it easier for people who are dropping off trays at odd hours. Could I make a, a, I could make a suggestion that the committee recommend that staff uh, take this under advisement and come back with uh, an assessment of what they might be able to do in this regard in the next month at the next meeting? Do I have a motion? Make a motion that the staff take it under advisement and come back with it.
More options. There's a second motion. All those in favor? Any power saying aye? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Announcements. You're welcome. Any announcements by members of the committee? Uh, I would just like to say that the congrats to the staff and volunteers. The um, the opening day was fabulous, and the visibility and the ambiance and the tours and it, I just love having all the volunteers and their their shirts. I mean, it makes you feel like you're. It's really fun. Thank you. So, but congratulations. I know it was a lot of work. I had a whole bunch of things to talk about today. A lot of them have been discussed either by volunteers that have uh, stood up um, and also by the presentation um, and also uh, by Kristen and Sarah. So um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things. As far as the new shelter goes, you know, I did read that. Uh, I did read that program. It's 300 and something or other pages. Um, and, you know, one theme that I see through there a lot that I feel like we're not, we're not there yet um, is that the Corret um, uh, report talks a lot about, it focuses on, you know, in shortening the length of stay and increasing programs uh, and increasing staff um, to an adequate, you know, an adequate level. Um, I don't, I don't feel like we're there yet. Um, obviously we're short, um, we're short on regular uh, amount of staff, but I feel like we've gone forward with the physical plans of the shelter. Um, without that adequate staffing and the programs to operate it in the man manner that it was designed, which was to flow the animals through the shelter more quickly. Um, the layout and the size of the new building creates new challenges that we are working to overcome together. Um, but again, through the architectural design program and the UC Davis report, repeatedly it states adequate staffing, management practices, and policy support for proactive length of stay must be in place to support animal flow through the facility. And we've done a lot in the last few years. We've added pet support and chin you know, a lot of different things. And I think we're doing things with our adoption programs. Um, but I do worry that we're not there yet. Um, my primary concern is for the welfare of the pets in our care. And I believe this is true for nearly every stakeholder in this room today. Um, volunteers have always played an active role in the humane care of our animals, simply because PAC has been severely understaffed for the last seven years that I've been involved. Um, and Christian and Sarah talked about this as well. Um, so much of the staff has played very little role in the actual care of our animals, aside from medically, um, which is also very understaffed. Care of our pets have been shouldered by volunteers, contractors, even inmates at times, and yet is such a critical function. This includes feeding, cleaning, socializing, exercising, monitoring for physical and mental well-being, advocating for medical care when needed, networking, fundraising, arranging outside training for medical care, and providing a finding life-saving option. Pretty much all aspects of care and advocacy. And I'm super excited about the rounds, because I've seen the rounds happening, and I see that the pets um, who are you know, starting to sniffle, things like that are getting pulled more quickly into our um, isolation, so I think that's a wonderful move. Um, <coughs> We have a responsibility to provide our animals the five freedoms and so much more. I don't think we're there yet. I think we're getting a lot better, but I don't think we're there. Um, we have increased our programs to reduce the population and increase the adoptions enrichment since these reports were published, but we were not. Uh, we are not where we need to be to keep our new shelter at or under capacity or to ensure the care they receive is where it needs to be. And animals are still falling through the cracks. I think, you know, without additional staffing and programs, volunteers are needed to continue the care they, they currently provide for our pets. With the new challenges and policies, this has become more difficult. We've talked about that. There's a lot of things we need to overcome together. Um, it is hard right now for volunteers to be heard, and it is hard that we're no longer permitted access to all areas of the shelter that we have previously um, been able to go to provide these functions. Communication is difficult. Did not add more staff to take over these roles. So without the volunteers to be able to continue their help in some of these areas, I feel we're falling short. Most significant to me is the medical attention that our residents, that our resident animals need. These are the animals that are in our population, not the ones that are coming into intake, 
not the ones that are um, in foster care, but the ones that are here and have been here for months and have um, minor things that they're just not getting seen for. Our wonderful medical team, despite their, their state of art facility, is maxed out and we consistently find ourselves in a situation where our residents are overlooked for days, weeks, or even months for routine or non-emergency medical issues. I know that we have staffing vacancies and plans for new positions, and I also know how long it takes to fill these positions. We critically need our leadership, staff, and volunteers to work together, all of us, as a cohesive team to operate this ship and to continue to provide top-notch care and achieve the flow needed to prevent this overcrowding in, in this new facility. So I just wanted to say that, um, you know, it takes all of us. We have to communicate. We have to respond to emails. We have to get together and get on the same page and make this work and understand that until we get to those staffing levels, you know, we have a talented and caring group of volunteers who are needed in these roles right now. So thank you. Right. Uh, finally, I wanted to take a moment and recognize our uh, Volunteers of the Month. Um, uh, Bonnie Harris, I don't know if she's here tonight, uh, but uh, Bonnie's been uh, a great supporter of PAC and, and is a, a real compliment to our volunteer program. She's been working with us for about four and a half years and she does everything from uh, running our community dog walks to teaching volunteer classes and orientation. I know you probably have run into Bonnie at some point with a slip knee around her neck and baseball cap. And, um, uh, she's really invaluable to us all. So uh, when you see her, give her a big hug and a pat on the back for all the work she does. Because uh, I know the certificates uh, are a memento, but we really appreciate the work that she does. And we also want to recognize a newer volunteer, Bobby Sullivan, this month. Um, and she started about five months ago, but she spends about uh, four times a week here uh, walking dogs and doing other chores around here and helping the puppies in particular. And we wanted to thank her so much for jumping in and helping us out. And uh, it's a big deal. So when you see them, say hi, and, they, and uh, we really appreciate the work. Okay? I move on with that then to uh, item seven of Dr. Smith. Do these people know they're being honored the day? <laughs> are they invited to the meeting? Uh, I thought they, oh, they are. Okay. 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 I was looking. Like as the record did. show, Mary Ellen yeah. not oh, in the ante and have a steak dinner here or something. <laughs> um, uh, and so any future agenda items from committee members, please? I, I had a thought when you were Christy, I really appreciate what you're saying, and I realize that we have a, a long ways to go in communication, but I see it happening. Yeah. You know, I really see it happening. I think the volunteers are more willing to, to work with the staff now, and the staff more willing to work with the, the volunteers now that we're in this new facility, and we have, we, it's like we have a new beginning. You know, this is us, we're going at it. But my thought was, um, you know, I've, I've spent 27 years in the Humane Society, and our volunteers there too were just invaluable. I mean, they meant everything to us because you cannot run a facility like this without help and your volunteers. But every year we would do an appreciation event for them. And, um, you know, we had probably 1,200 volunteers in the books, but maybe 100 of them would show up to this event. And it was fun because we, our staff was there to thank them and sit and talk with them. And it gave, it gave, gave them an opportunity to talk with us and meet with us. And, you know, any employee that that we could get from the shelter to come down and even ask some of the employees on their days off to come in. And, of course, we paid them, but still, we wanted them to, to get to know the volunteers because they didn't know all the volunteers. And I don't know if that's something that we're ready for in the pack yet, but I definitely think that it's, especially with this new facility, there's plenty of room, that we could do something like that. And we could reach out to the community even for donations of food or, I don't know, I mean, I think it would be a really nice uh, opportunity to start in making those uh, bonds. Pat, I think Gina does do something. Yeah, she does. And that effect at least once a year, but I think she's been doing it a couple times a year. But 
but it's specifically volunteers, I think there hasn't been as much. Yeah, I, I just yeah. 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 I was just going to say, um, she typically does it during the Volunteer Appreciation Week, which is in April. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kristen. At some point, I'd like uh, just an update for, it can be an update on the Friends of PAC and what they're doing on the nonprofit, the fundraising side. Um, and it doesn't have to be a report, just what they're doing and et cetera. Uh, and then I'd also like to know, maybe you all know, um, what's the update on PAUSE, the group? You know, that's all the organizations. We, we are having a um, February 2nd at um, Abrams. We're going to be having our semi-annual gathering. And it should be posted next week, I think, yes. on, online. And it would be so nice if you were able to make it. Uh, Marcy's also on that committee. Tammy's on that committee. Is there anybody else in the room? Dr. Garcia is on it. And we're, uh, Adam, where's Adam? We're behind you. Adam was sitting here. <laughs> um, you know, so it's, it's a, yeah, there's a lot of, um, it's a great committee. I really love working with these people. And well, maybe a supplier that describes the, the members. Update. Just an update. I can do that. As well as inviting us to the February, but mm -hmm. maybe later on this spring it can just be a simple, here's what we're doing and here are the members that are active and here's who we don't let come. I got some information to, to Mary Ellen and then she could just email it out to yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, also, I just wanted to let the community know that at some point in the future, I know Kristen is working on uh, uh, delivery of her kind of vision goals and objectives for the organization, which she sh has been sharing with us in part. Uh, that, and, and I want her to be ready when she wants to do that, but I know that she's working on for us, and that will be on the agenda. And we'll have discussions about that. Okay. Uh, with that said, um, uh, motion for adjournment. Mm -hmm. Motion for adjournment. Mm -hmm. Motion for adjournment. Motion for adjournment.